high percentage of young people in the underdeveloped countries poses specific problems for the government that must be addressed lucidly. The idle and often illiterate urban youth is exposed to all kinds of disrupting influences. Youth in the underdeveloped countries is, in most cases, marketed entertainment from the industrialized countries. As a rule, there is some correlation between the mental and material level of a society and the leisure activities it provides. In the underdeveloped countries, however, the young generation has access to entertainment devised for the youth of the capitalist countries, detective stories, slot machines, hardcore photos, pornographic literature, R-rated films, and above all, alcohol. In the West, the family environment, school, and relatively high standard of living of the working masses serve as a kind of bulwark against the harmful effects of this entertainment. But in an African country, where intellectual development is unequal, where the violent clash of two worlds has seriously taken up the old traditions and disrupted the way... Shaken up, sorry, let's try that again. But in an African country, where intellectual development is unequal, where the violent clash of two worlds has seriously shaken up the old traditions and disrupted ways of thinking, the affectivity and sensitivity of the young African are at the mercy of the aggression contained in Western culture. His family very often proves incapable of counteracting this violence with stability and homogeneity. In this area, the government must serve as a filter and stabilizer. The commissioners for youth in the underdeveloped countries frequently make one mistake. They see their role as equivalent to that of commissioners for the youth in the developed countries. They talk of fortifying the soul, developing the body, and encouraging talent in sports. In our opinion, they should be wary of such ideas. The youth of an underdeveloped country is often an idle youth, and must first of all be occupied. This is why the commissioner for youth must report to the Ministry for Labor. The Ministry for Labor, which is a requirement for an underdeveloped country, works in close collaboration with the Ministry for Planning, another requirement in an underdeveloped country. The youth of Africa should not be oriented toward the stadiums, but toward the fields, the fields and the schools. The stadium is not an urban showpiece, but a rural space that is cleared, worked, and offered to the nation. The capitalist notion of sports is fundamentally different from that which should exist in an underdeveloped country. The African politicians should not be concerned with producing professional sportsmen, but conscious individuals who, are, who also practice sports. If sports are not incorporated into the life of the nation, i.e. in the building of the nation, if we produce national sportsmen instead of conscious individuals, then sports will quickly be ruined by professionalism and commercialism. A sport should not be a game or entertainment for the urban bourgeoisie. Our greatest task is to constantly understand that what is under, blah, 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 blah. Our greatest task is to constantly understand what is happening in our own countries. We must not cultivate the spirit of the exceptional or look for the hero, another form of leader. We must elevate the people, expand their minds, equip them, differentiate them, and humanize them. Right, so... Fanon's taking on two points here. First, that the elevation of sports tends towards commodification and professionalism. It becomes entertainment for the urban bourgeoisie. 
Second, relying on sports to occupy the youth often leads to a cultural valorization of athletes as heroes or leaders when you should, according to Fanon, learn cooperation and group cohesion while still retaining their innate difference and humanity, of course. Um, he's warning against the same things that are he was warning about earlier um, about the national leaders um, and the and the party as well um, all of those things have to be mitigated in some respect so that uh, the will of the people remains strong and and collective rather than individualistic once again we turn to the obsession that we would like to be, see shared by every african politician the need to shed light on the people's efforts to rehabilitate work to, and rid it of its historical opacity to be responsible in an underdeveloped country is to know that everything finally rests on educating the masses, elevating their minds, and on what is all too quickly assumed to be political education. It is commonly thought with criminal flippancy that to politicize the masses means, from time to time, haranguing them with a major political speech. It is thought that for a leader or head of state to speak on major current issues in a pedantic, pedantic tone, a voice is sufficient as obligation to politicize the masses. But political education means opening up the mind, awakening the mind, and introducing it to the world. It is as Césaire said, to invent the souls of men. To politicize the masses is not and cannot be to make a political speech. It means driving home to the masses that everything depends on them, that if we stagnate, the fault is theirs, and that if we progress, they too are responsible, that there is no demiurge, no illustrious man taking responsibility for everything, but that the demiurge is the people, and the magic lies in their hands, and their hands alone. In order to achieve such things, in order to actually embody them, we must, as we have already mentioned, decentralize to the utmost. The flow of ideas from the upper echelons to the rank and file and vice versa must be an unwavering principle, not for merely formal reasons, but quite simply because adherence to the principle is the guarantee of salvation. It is the forces from the rank and file which rise up to energize the leadership and permit it dialectically to make the, a new leap forward. Once again, we Algerians very quickly understood this, for no member of the upper echelons has been able to take precedence in any mission of salvation. It is the rank and file which fights in Algeria, and they are fully aware that without their difficult and heroic, state, heroic daily struggle, the upper echelons would collapse, just as they are aware that without the upper echelons, the leadership, the rank and file would and echelons and leadership, the rank and file would disintegrate into chaos and anarchy. The power structure draws its validity and strength solely from the existence of the people's struggle. In practice, it is the people who choose a power structure of their own free will, and not the power structure that suffers the people. The masses must realize that the government and the party are at their surface. A people worthy of esteem, i.e. conscious of their dignity, is a people who never forget this obvious fact. During the colonial occupation, the people were told they had to sacrifice their lives for the sake of dignity. But the African peoples quickly realized that it is not only the occupier who threatened their dignity. 
the African peoples quickly realized that dignity and sovereignty were exact equivalents. In fact, a free people living in dignity is a sovereign people. A people living in dignity is a responsible people. And there is no point demonstrating, quote unquote, that the African peoples are infantile or retarded. A government and a party get the people they deserve. And in more or less long term, a people gets the government it deserves. Basically being, you know, <laughs> having <laughs> dignity uh, requires self-sovereignty, right? Being dignified, um, having, having self-dignity is, means being a, ooh, ooh, that one's fun. Yeah, being self-dignified means, in part, being self-actualized and self-governing. The masses must realize that the government and the party are their ser are at their service. A people worthy of esteem, i.e., conscious of their dignity, is a people who never forget this obvious fact. During the colonial occupation, the people were told they had to sacrifice their lives for the sake of dignity. But the African peoples quickly realized that it was not only the occupier who threatened their dignity. The African peoples quickly realized that dignity and sovereignty were exact equivalents. In fact, a free people living in dignity is a sovereign people. A people living in dignity is a responsible people, and there is no point demonstrating that the African people are African peoples are infantile or retarded. A government and a party get the people they deserve, and in the more or less long term, a people gets the government it deserves. If the people are um self-actualized to to take a uh, kind of liberal <laughs> liberal framework of it if the people are self-motivated and are um realize their own dignity um then they will have they will be sovereign they'll have a sovereign nation the above arguments are borne out by actual experience in certain regions. It sometimes occurs during a meeting that a militant's answer to a difficult problem is, all we need to do is. This voluntary shortcut, which dangerously combines spontaneity, simplistic syncretism, and little intellectual elaboration, frequently wins the day. Every time we encounter this abdication of responsibility in a militant, it is not enough to say that he is wrong. He has to be made responsible, encouraged to follow through his chain of reasoning to its conclusion, and taught to grasp the often, incur the often atrocious, inhuman, and finally sterile nature of this all you need to do is. Uh. Nobody has a monopoly on truth, neither the leader nor the militant. The search for truth in local situations is the responsibility of the community. Some militants have a broader experience, are quicker to gather their thoughts, and in the past have succeeded in making a greater number of inferences. But they, shouldn't, they should avoid overshadowing the people for the successful outcome of any decision depends on the conscious, coordinated commitment of the people as a whole. We are all in the same boat. Everybody will be slaughtered or tortured, and within the context of the independent nation, everyone will suffer the same hunger and marasmus. The collective struggle presupposes a collective responsibility from the rank and file, and a collegial responsibility at the top. Yes, everyone must be involved in the struggle for the sake of the common salvation. There are no clean hands, no innocent, no innocent bystanders. We are all in the pro process of dirtying our hands 
in the quagmire of our soil and the terrifying void of our minds. Any bystander is a coward and a traitor. The duty of a leadership is to have the masses at their side. Any commitment, however, presupposes awareness and understanding of the mission to be accomplished. In short, a rational analysis, no matter how embryonic. The people should not be mesmerized, swayed by emotion, or confused. Only underdeveloped countries led by a revolutionary elite emanating from the people can today empower the masses to step onto the stage of history. But once again, on the condition that we vigorously and decisively reject the formation of a national bourgeoisie, a caste of privileged individuals. To politicize the masses is to make the nation in its totality a reality for every citizen. To make the experience of the nation the experience of every citizen. As President Seiko Tori so aptly reminded us in his address to the Second Congress of African Writers. Quote, In the realm of thought, man can claim to be the brain of the world, but in reality, where every action affects spiritual and physical being, the world is the brain of mankind. For it is here that are concentrated the totalization of powers and elements of thought, the dynamic forces of development and improvement. And it is here, too, that energies are merged and the sum total of man's intellectual values is finally inscribed. Since individual experience is national, since it is a link in the national chain, it ceases to be individual, narrow, and limited in scope, and can lead to the truth of the nation and the world. Just as every fighter clung to the nation during the period of armed struggle, so during the period of nation building, every citizen must continue in his daily purpose to embrace the nation as a whole, to embody the constantly dialectical truth of the nation, and to will here and now the triumph of man in his totality. If the building of a bridge does not enrich the consciousness of those working on it, then don't build the bridge, and let the citizens continue to swim across the river or use a ferry. The bridge must not be pitchforked or foisted upon the social landscape by a deus ex machina, but, on the contrary, must be the product of the citizens' brains and muscles. And there is no doubt architects and engineers, foreigners for the most part, will probably be needed, but the local party leaders must see to it that the, that the techniques seep into the desert of the citizen's brain so that the bridge in its entirety and in every detail can be integrated, redesigned, and reappropriated. The citizen must appropriate the bridge. Then, and only then, is everything possible. A government that proclaims itself national must take responsibility for the entire nation, and in underdeveloped countries, the youth represents one of the most important sectors. The consciousness of the younger generation must be elevated and enlightened. It is this younger generation that will compose the national army. If they have been adequately informed, if the national mo youth movement has done its work of integrating the youth into the nation, then the mistakes that have compri compromised, even undermined the future of the Latin American republics, will have been avoided. The army is never a school for war, but a school for civics, a school for politics. The soldier in a mature nation is not a mercenary, but a citizen who defends the nation by the use of arms. This is why it is paramount that the soldier knows can't hear he is at the service of his country and not of an officer, however illustrious he may be. Military and civilian national services must be used to raise the level of national consciousness to detribalize and unify. 
In an underdeveloped country, the mobilization of men and women should be undertaken as quickly as possible. The underdeveloped country must take precautions not to perpetuate feudal traditions that give priority to men over women. Women shall be given equal importance to men, not in the articles of the constitution, but in daily life, at the factory, in the schools, and in assemblies. If the countries of the West station their soldiers in barracks, this does not mean this is the best solution. We are not obliged to militarize recruits. National service can be civilian or military, and in any case, every able-bodied citizen should be able to join his fighting unit at a moment's notice to defend the freedom of the nation and its civil liberties. In this segment, there's the tired but very true adage that the youth is the future. To that end, the youth must be politically and socially educated so that they are informed while performing national service. This must be egalitarian, uh, men and women having the same status, not just legally but socially, and can take either civilian or military form. Um, if I remember correctly, I, I'm pretty sure I'm correct on this, but uh, Burkina Faso under Thomas Sankara um, had this kind of equality going on. Um, I think I think it was equal men and women in the military um, and doing like you know th they uh, Burkina Faso, I believe at the time at least had like, very high, like, uh, equity rates between men and women. Anyway, continuing on. The major public pro works projects of national interest should be carried out by the recruits. This is a highly effective way of stimulating stagnant regions and getting the greatest number of citizens to learn of the country's realities. We should avoid transforming the army into an autonomous body that sooner or later idle and aimless will go into politics and threaten the authorities. By dint of haunting the corridors of power, armchair generals dream of pronunciamentos. The only way of avoiding this is to politicize the army, i.e. nationalize it. Likewise, there is an urgent need to strengthen the militia. In the event of war, it is the entire nation which fights or works. There should be no professional soldiers, and the number of career officers should be kept to a minimum. First of all, because very often the officers are selected from university graduates who would be much more useful elsewhere. An engineer is a thousand times more indispensable to the nation than an officer. And secondly, any hint of a caste consciousness should be eliminated. We have seen in the preceding pages how nationalism, that magnificent hymn which roused the masses against the oppressor, disintegrates in the aftermath of independence. Nationalism is not a political doctrine. It is not a program. If we really want to safeguard our countries from regression, paralysis, or collapse, we must rapidly we must rapidly switch from a national consciousness to a social and political consciousness. The nation can only come into being in a program elaborated by a revolutionary leadership and enthusiastically and lucidly appropriated by the masses. The national effort must be constantly situated in the general context of the underdeveloped countries. 
the front line against hunger and darkness, the front line against poverty and stunted consciousness, must be present in the minds and muscles of the men and women. The work of the masses, their determination to conquer the scorches that for centuries have excluded them from the history of the human mind, must be connected to the work and determination of all the underdeveloped peoples. There is a kind of collective endeavor, a common destiny among the underdeveloped masses. The peoples of the third world are not interested in news about King Badouin's wedding or the affairs of the Italian bourgeoisie. What we want to hear are the are case histories in Argentina or Burma about the fight against illiteracy or the dictatorial behavior of the leaders. This is the material that inspires us, educates us, and greatly increases our effectiveness. As we have seen, a government needs a program if it really wants to liberate the people politically and socially. Not only an economic program, but also a policy on the distribution of wealth and social relations. In fact, there must be a concept of man, a concept of about the future of mankind. Which means that no sermon, no complicity with the former occupier can replace a program. The people, at first unenlightened and then increasingly lucid, will vehemently demand such a program. The Africans and the underdeveloped peoples, contrary to what is commonly believed, are quick to build a social and political consciousness. The danger is that very often they reach the stage of social consciousness before reaching the national phase. In this case, the underdeveloped country's violent calls for social justices are combined, paradoxically enough, with an often primitive tribalism. The underdeveloped, country, the underdeveloped peoples behave like a starving population, which means that the days of those who treat Africa as their playground are strictly numbered. In other words, their powers, their power cannot last forever. A bourgeoisie that has only nationalism to feed the people fails in its mission to, and inevitably gets tangled up in a series of trials and tribulations. If nationalism is not explained, enriched, and deepened, if it, does not end very, if it does not very quickly turn into a social and political consciousness, into humanism, then it leads to a dead end. A bourgeois leadership of the underdeveloped countries confines the national consciousness to a sterile formalism. Only the masses' commitment by men and women to judicious and productive tasks gives form and substance to this consciousness. It is then that flags and government buildings cease to be the symbols of the nation. The nation deserts the false glitter of the capital and takes refuge in the interior where it receives life and energy. The living expression of the nation is the collective consciousness in motion of the entire people. It is the enlightened and coherent praxis of the men and women. The collective forging forging of a destiny implies undertaking responsibility on a truly historical scale. Otherwise, there is anarchy, repression, the emergence of tribalized parties, and federalism, etc. If the national government wants to be national, it must govern by the people and for the people, for the disinherited and by the disinherited. No leader, whatever his worth, can replace the will of the people, and the national government... <laughs> Man, he's really talkative right now. Uh, no leader, whatever his worth, can replace the will of the people, and 
the national government, before concerning itself with international prestige, must first restore dignity to all citizens, furnish their minds, fill their eyes with human things, and develop a human landscape for the sake of its enlightenment, if, of its enlightened and sovereign inhabitants. Okay, so I have three things um, at the end of this. One. The military should be heavily restricted in specific ways, uh, with minimal military officials, no professional soldiers, etc., so as to not cast the military apart from the citizenry, right, to integrate the, this civilian military, um, into the rest of civil society, so that there isn't much differentiation between soldiers and the rest of the citizenry. The second part is post-colonially consciousness should be shifted away from a national focus towards a social consciousness. Happening in reverse can often lead to problems but does not necessarily doom the project. Nationalism can't put forth a real political project. However, social consciousness and awareness of the situation of the underdeveloped countries more broadly can. And thirdly, this social consciousness must supersede the national consciousness and create a broader humanitarian focus. The national project basically transitions or should transition over from, from being a national project you know, based, based in the nation to a humanist project based in the people living in the nation, right? Um, the, it, it shouldn't just be an idealistic project that like, here are our values, but it should actually implement those values in a way that is egalitarian and lifts the people living in the country up. And also, you know, is concerned, um, he mentions, you know, wanting to understand, uh, where is it? Oh, yeah, he talks, he says, well, we want to hear our case histories in Argentina or Burma about the fight against illiteracy or the dictor dictatorial behavior of other leaders. So they want to be, um, involved in international politics in a liberatory and a liberating way and to, be um, informed on on international politics or the politics of other nations um, in the third world at this point, right? Um, what we would call the global south now, um, but was at this time labeled the third world um, as it was apart from the first world of Europe and uh North America, or specifically the U.S. and Canada, and uh, the second world of the Soviet Union and its satellites. Thank you for watching this reading of Frantz Fanon's Wretched of the Earth. If you enjoy what you saw, please give this video a thumbs up and consider subscribing to my channel if you haven't done so already. I've got my Twitch and Twitter handles up there. I'll also have links to those in the description. Twitch is where we record most of these videos, and then I edit them together into a more cohesive, less rambly bit. Um, there's also ways you can support me in this channel, and um, links to my Discord, my music, all that kind of fun stuff. So if you enjoyed it, please consider hitting those up. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.